Hello, everyone. Welcome to another module of the State Library of Iowa's endorsement program. We are in the core coursework right now in the Foundations of Public Libraries course, and the module topic we're discussing today is Library as Place. Um, it's kind of a weird title. It's a big concept, um, but give me just a minute to introduce myself and we will dive right in. So my name is Samantha Bowers. Uh, I am the consultant for continuing education at the State Library of Iowa. Um, Basically, this means that I work with all of the continuing ed and professional development that we offer to libraries around the state all year long, and I sort of oversee and manage our endorsement program, uh, which used to be called certification, um, but this is kind of the title we've chosen for now. It's in a number of different types of libraries um, in my working career and have been at the State Library as of this recording um, just over three years. Um, I really care about this topic because um, as I get to travel around, I've done a lot more traveling lately than I did when I first started, but it's so interesting to me to see how libraries use their space, their place, as a way to engage and support their community. And so as we start thinking about library as place, um, I've been to a lot of libraries, I've seen their spaces and places, and uh, to me it's really exciting to see see the opportunity for connection, uh, life enrichment, community development that libraries can offer. So I hope to share a little bit about that all with you in this module. Here are our formal learning objectives. You can read them on the slide, um, but we're going to define this idea of a third place. Um, this was a term coined by um, a sociologist named Ray Oldenburg way back in the 1980s. So we'll define what a third place is and what it can be for a community and for its people. Uh, we're going to talk about public libraries as being third places. And then we are going to talk about how um, kind of some practical ways that your library can implement some of these ideas from, uh, from Dr. Oldenburg. I did find before we dive into this uh, third place theory, um, I found this definition of libraries as place. And basically, I'm not going to read the whole thing to you here, but basically what we mean when we think about the overall facility or place of the library is um, what a term that an architect or a sociologist might call the built environment. So you have to think not only about your facility itself, but everything within the facility, the restrooms, the distance of the stacks from each other, um, how accessible it is, the sidewalks and parking lots and ramps and steps and all of those things that go into making up your library. Um, we also place our libraries a little bit more abstractly within the historical and cultural context that we live in right now. And if you watch the foundations module on um, principles of a noble profession, we talked a lot about this in that module, so I'm not gonna go into more of it here, but basically this idea that our library is certainly the facility itself, and everything that goes into that facility, but also a little bit more broadly what that represents and what that means to our communities. So with that kind of groundwork level setting here, um, this is basically our third place definitional slide here. So in a book uh, published in 1989 called The Great Good Place, Ray Oldenburg, again, coming out of the sociology academic tradition, looked around, he kind of looked at his own life. He had been living in um, Pensacola, Florida, and was feeling like in this sort of suburb environment where I live, something is missing in my life and in the life of the community members that I interact with regularly. You know, we all have our homes. We all have that first place. And home can mean different things to different people, but at the end of the day, home is your space. Uh, you don't have to wear your shoes there. You don't have to wear your, all your clothes there or any of your clothes there if you don't want to. Um, you are responsible for that place, however. Um, there are certain rules you must follow there. You have to mow your lawn. Uh, you have to maintain a certain, perhaps according to your homeowners association, a certain level of care of that place. You are responsible for it. Um, but it is also a place where you can relax. That's your first place. Um, your second place is your workplace. This is a space of productivity. So a working adult would certainly think of this as their office or job life. Maybe they work in a blue collar factory or a service industry. 
um, with a really defined place that they have to go. Um, obviously, the COVID-19 pandemic made those first and second places merge in ways that many of us were not expecting them to. Um, but most of our public, most of you all watching this, working in public libraries probably have um, a workplace, a public library that you go to work in, although you might not necessarily. Um, but uh, a student would think of this place as their school, um, the place where they go to learn, uh, to be productive in that sense. But what we're talking about today is the third place, the community place. And he says of uh, third places, um, the author of this book, the third place is inclusively sociable, offering both the basis of the community and the celebration of it. So it's not your first place. You're not caring for things and people. You're not cooking it, cooking there, cleaning there. Um, it's not your second place. It's not a place of productivity. You're not earning money there. You're not engaging in uh, productive activities there. Um, it's it's a third place, a place to unwind and relax. And I think we can think about this, especially in the American term and the American context, as growing out of this um, missing or craving the small town life that many people, not all people, um, it was my lived experience growing up. It might not have been yours, but the small town and all of its um, perhaps mythical glory to say you can walk down the street and everyone says hello and everyone knows who you are and um, you really are disengaged and plugged into that community. Um, it's obviously not a sustainable way to live. Not everyone can live in small towns. Um, and yet everyone needs and craves that personal connection with people in their neighborhood, with people in their community. And so he offers these eight criteria um, for a third place, and not necessarily to recreate a small town, but to perhaps capture some of those ideals that linger in the back of our minds as things that we think might be nice for our lives. Um, so his first, his first offering here is a, of a criteria is neutral ground. So this is what takes it out of that first place. No one is no one is playing host. No one has to um, is responsible for that space necessarily. Um, that, that is participating in it as a third space. It is owned by a, a co the coffee shop owner or the the pub owner. It's staffed by um, baristas or um, you know the people who manage the bowling alley, um, the the bartender perhaps. But it's not any one person's. Uh, home, and that makes it neutral ground. It's a social leveler, and um, I have a bone to pick with this one, perhaps, but it is, in theory, open to uh, anybody. And so often the third places that Dr. Oldenburg defines are um, spaces where you do have to pay something in order to be there. So you have to buy a cup of coffee, you have to buy a beer, uh, you have to rent your bowling shoes, or whatever it is, um, rent your space on the lane. Um, these are, you know, um, coffee shops, pubs, and bowling alleys being some of his big examples that he returns to frequently. Um, but you could also think of something like a McDonald's. It could be as simple as a fast food restaurant. It could be somewhere like a mall where you might not have to buy something, but you certainly are surrounded by um, things to buy. Um, but that social leveler, theoretically, anyone is able to be in that space. Um, you don't have to pay a membership fee. You don't have to uh, you know, be a certain type of person or have a certain profession, anyone may be there. Um, the third bullet point, conversation is the main activity. Uh, and the, the subtitle for this one, as uh, this Carnegie Mellon University quote uh, pulls out, is nothing more clearly indicates a third place than that the talk there is good. So it's not like your second space where you're going to particularly accomplish a task, um, but you're there just to, you know, to use a euphemism, shoot the breeze. Hear what people are up to. Talk about the latest sporting event. Kick the ball with politics. Um, test out that joke you've been wanting to tell. See if people laugh at it. Um, but you're there just to talk and be talked to. Um, by accessibility and accommodation, this fourth bullet point here, he doesn't necessarily mean um, accessibility in terms of the ADA or anything like that, although I think that does play into it. Um, but what he means by accessibility is it's in your neighborhood. You could walk there or bike there or easily stop there on your way home from work. Um, it's not, you're not driving 20, 30 minutes out of your way in order to engage with this space. 
Um, but it's right there. It's easy. It's simple. You're going to see the people in your neighborhood that you know, and you'll have a chance to do these other things we're talking about there. Um, a third place has regulars. Uh, you're going to recognize a lot of people there, whether you know them from the grocery store, perhaps, or they're your neighbors up the block. Um, but you'll begin to recognize people there. Um, they're usually low profile. They're not attracting a lot of external people because they're big and flashy tourist destinations. Um, they're just comfortable and plain. Uh, the mood is playful. This kind of ties back into that conversational one. Uh, we're not there to you know, have the next great debate. Uh, we're just there to uh, tell jokes, laugh, talk, maybe play some pool or go bowl, do bowl a few lanes, but we're just there having fun. And then the last one says it's a home away from home. Um, it's not, it's not your home. Uh, you don't behave there quite like you do in your first place, um, but it is comfortable. It's a place you can relax. It's a place where you know people and maybe in some ways you'll be more relaxed in this third place. If there are extra pressures on you at home, some of those extra burdens, it's a chance um, to get away from those and be in a different space. So I think you can probably look at your own life and think, maybe I have a third place, maybe I don't. Uh, it seems, you know, it, it seems nice, but is it strictly necessary? Um, and of course, the answer is it's not food or water. You don't absolutely need it in order to survive. And yet, um, I credit one of my coworkers for designing this graphic for me. But as I read the literature on third places and community spaces and why they matter. Um, you can see on this word cloud, they mean a great deal. So if you have that third place, you're obviously going to be less lonely. Um, you've got people you're regularly talking with who care about you, who are going to send you a text or give you a call if you haven't turned up in that place for, for a few days. Um, and people who are less lonely live longer. They have better mental health and better physical health. Um, people who are engaged in third places have an overall improved quality of life, which can lead to a number of different improved outcomes. Um, they're happier. They have a sense of attachment to their community. The community itself is empowered um, as people are networking and engaging and, and talking about ways to improve the community. Um, you gain new perspectives. You're talking with people who may not be like you, um, who may bring a different point of view to your life. So I think you can read through this. I've got a whole list at the end of um, references and another reading, um, but third places really do matter uh, to the community as a whole and to individuals within the community, um, just uh, as ways to improve people's lives, as I've already said, um, and the community outcomes also are, are, are absolutely staggering. So you might be thinking about your town. Um, it might be a big town, it might be a small town. You might be thinking, we don't really have a place like that in our town. We have no place where it's easy to go grab a cup of coffee and shoot the breeze. We have no place where uh, you could just happen to run into people that you like and care about. Uh, maybe our town is so big or it's a, it's a suburban community that all of those places are out on the periphery, out by the highway, hard to get to. Um, can my library be a third place? And obviously we're here today to say that, yes, I think, I think it really can. Um, so as we think through those eight criteria for, um, for a third place, your library certainly is neutral ground. <laughs> Nobody lives there. It might feel like you do, uh, but you do not most likely live, actually live at your library. Um, your library, even better, I think, than a McDonald's or a mall or a pub um, is a social leveler. You know, you have a, a, a charge as being a public space to serve everybody, no matter what they look like or what money they have or don't have. Um, everyone is invited and welcome into your library. The conversational one might not fit with your library as a whole, although I think you can certainly look to different spaces and programming that your library does as ways that you can tap into this aspect of being a third place. You know, do you have a coffee club, for example, that meets every Thursday? That's a conversational space. You might have certain parts of the library that you open up to be more conversational and certain parts of the library that maybe function a little bit more like a second place where people work or study. Um, so that, that conversational one may or may not fit. Um, it's accessible, your library. Um, I see a lot of libraries right on the main street of town. You're right there by the post office or the grocery store. People are easily able to get in and out. 
And even if you're not, you know, on a bus line or on the main street, um, there are things that you can do to make sure that your library um, is easy to get to. Uh, maybe it's making sure you have a nice big parking lot. If you do have more of a driving community, people can drive in and easily park. Um, maybe try and get a, work with the city or county to get a bike trail out to your library. And people could easily bike or walk there. Um, but in general, most of the libraries I see are fairly accessible in that point of view. Um, usually a library will have regulars. Uh, I don't think you need to spell this one out. Sometimes you're glad to see your regulars and sometimes you wish they weren't quite so regular, but they are there. Um, the low profile one, if you've watched the module on um, principles of a noble profession, you know that libraries are not always low profile. And yet, um, Sometimes they are, and also sometimes you can build spaces within your library to make them a little more, um, maybe the building itself is big and grand, but you can make a space that's low profile and very comfy. And I think uh, this bottom example there on the Hopkinton Public Library is a good example of that. The building itself is, is a beautiful old bank building. It is right on the main street there in small Hopkinton. Um, it's not huge, uh, but it is, it's very pretty. In the back of the library, they have that teen space. Simple as a couple of cozy little chairs, a little lamp, a table, some books, and voila. You've got a simple, low, pro low profile, but also conversational, accessible, playful space um, that really um, just speaks to how that library made a third place for teens in their community. Um, playful mood, I have this example from the Clarinda Public Library up here. They have a Lego club for their kids and they've got the Lego sitting right there when you walk in the front door. It doesn't get much more playful than that, does it? Um, of course, some libraries really do have a tradition of, of scholarship. And so maybe not every place in your library um, is gonna be playful, but you certainly can do some things to increase that playfulness of it and just make it really fun and comfortable for folks. Um, and a home away from home. Uh, I think a lot of libraries can can be that way. And again, maybe it's certain spaces within your library, um, but just a way for people to relax, catch up, be comfortable. This is a good point, And I've kind of been hinting at this as we've gone through how each of these criteria fit in with the mission of public libraries. Um, but your library um, might feel like or actually be all three types of the places that Ray Oldenburg defines. So you might have people in your library who are doing things that you or I might typically do at our first place, getting cleaned up um, in, in your bathroom sinks, perhaps um, taking a nap, um, eating. These are all things that we might normally do in our first place, but they might not have a comfortable or safe place to do those things during the day. Um, you certainly have people using your library as a second space, students who come in to study there, Maybe business people who don't want to work from their home anymore come in to work for a while or take a meeting. Um, and for, certainly for you, librarian watching this webinar, um, it is your second place. Um, and so I think it's important to acknowledge that all three types of places come into play, um, but how important it is to our communities that we foster our identity as a third place. This next slide here um, kind of ties together some of what we talked about in that principles of a noble profession building along with along with these ideas today. So we have our shared space. We have that facility that we've been talking about. We have the shared ideas that are shared there, the people that are there talking, the types of speakers you bring in, the, way, the conversations that you librarian have with your patrons and that patrons have with each other, all these ideas floating around. And of course, we have our collections, which we're going to talk more about in a little bit. But you don't have a library unless you have all of those things, shared spaces, shared ideas and shared collections. And um, I have to credit a former coworker of mine with this illustration here, but um, this screenshot of the ladies singing there in their beautiful costumes and hats is from the movie, uh, from the show, The Music Man, the great Iowa musical. And they are singing about Miser Madison, sort of uh, the town grump, um, but also the town benefactor. And um, what Miser Madison did when he was um, leaving his legacy behind was, and this is a quote from, from the lady singing, he left River City, the library building, but he left all the books to Marion. And so 
uh, Miser Madison knew that the city didn't really like Marion and Marion didn't really like the city and Marion is the librarian here. Um, and yet Miser Madison said, those people won't have a library if they don't have a building and they won't have a library if they don't have the books. Uh, they need both the books and the building in order to be there, in order to be a library in this town. And of course, the ideas that go along with all of that too, you can watch The Music Man and learn about some of the ideas that Marion was allegedly spreading. Um, but we've talked about the idea of libraries and the principles of a noble profession. We're gonna talk more about our collections in later modules. Um, and we're talking now about the space, but I just encourage you guys with this illustration to say all three of those things matter uh, to your library and to the spaces that you create. Here are some examples of libraries being their places. Um, so on the top left, we have the Iowa City Public Library got together a very diverse group of people to do this craft night. And certainly they're being productive. They're working on whatever that thing is that they're working on. Um, but, you know, they're also there talking about the movies they just watched or um, the colors that they like, the sports that they're into, how they got to the library, what's going on in the community. And I love to see that level playing field of men and women and older people and kids all in dialogue together in the same space in their community. Um, I've got two examples of kids on this slide as well in the top right. And in the bottom left, um, these are kids just hanging out. It looks like they're just having fun. Um, they're eating lunch, they're playing, they're talking. Um, they're really engaged in that third place idea of their community. And then I think um, in the middle, uh, we have the, um, I believe that's from the uh, Clarinda Public Library. And in the bottom right, um, the Winterset Public Library. This These images to me really speak to that home away from home. And we've got a couple of people there working on a puzzle, uh, just like they might do in their own living room. Uh, but here they get to be at the library. They get to see other people they might not normally see and chat and work on that puzzle. And then um, nothing says third place quite like a cup of coffee. This is me, the non-coffee drinker. But, um, you know, one of the best things perhaps that you can do to make your library a third place in your community is have a free coffee hour. Uh, see who starts coming. I guarantee you're going to get regulars. I guarantee they're going to talk. Um, in winter set, they actually had to move it into a different part of the library because they were talking so loud um, that other parts of the library were feeling disrupted. But you know what they said? Hey, these people are here. They care about our community. Uh, they're talking. They're laughing. For that time of day, they are not lonely. And that is a good thing. So uh, those, those third places in action there in Iowa Public Libraries. Here is a quote um, from the magazine Curbed with just a couple more examples of what a third place can be, active but not regulated. So are there some, in order to foster third placeness at your library, are there some rules that you need to do away with? Would it really be such a big deal if people ate up in that front part of your library? I know you don't maybe want the liquids and foods near the books, but can we maybe take away some of those regulations with which libraries are usually associated, uh, but without causing chaos, which is sort of the next next voice. Um, obviously, do your own thing at the pace you want to do it. Libraries are well known for that. Come explore. How many of you have um, exploration and creativity in your vision statements, mission statements? Um, you feel welcome. I know that libraries all over the place go out of their way to help everyone feel welcome, and certainly that's a huge part of being in the third place people you know and people you don't know, um, and curiosity. I think that these are all just big, big parts of third place and big parts of how a library can get involved. I have a couple more examples as we um, begin to conclude here, but um, again, those eight points of a third place neutral ground social level are conversational, accessible, they have regulars, they're low profile, I uh, have a home and a playful mood and a home away from home. So um, up on the top, this is the Marion Public Library. Um, these ladies here chit chatting in front of the giant light bright wall, certainly very playful mood. Um, to me, this also indicates that it's a really accessible space. Um, you see families there. A lot of families walk, bike, 
to the library. Um, so there's, they're obviously, they got there and they're comfortable there, chit-chatting away, um, very conversational. Um, the flyer poster in the bottom middle there, a way to illustrate that this may or may not just happen organically for your life. Um, I showed the example on the previous slide from the Winterset Public Library's Coffee Club, and that is one of the flyers there on this poster board. This is from the Winterset Public Library. Um, they do all kinds of programming to sponsor this third place aspect to their library. Um, and they've been hard at it for a couple of years and seen a ton of fruit. They've got lots and lots of people that come to their library to hang out and to talk and to learn. And so, you know, offer different programs and find ways that you can do that in your community. You might look at this picture in the bottom left, the TV screen in the storage area and think, what on earth? How is this a third space? It's a storage room. Um, but this I think is an example of use what you have and work with what you got. So um, this example comes to me from a coworker at the Ellsworth Public Library. Um, but that TV is hooked up to a gaming system, and there's some gaming chairs sitting down on the floor there where teens can hang out and play a game. Do they care that it's not fancy? Absolutely they don't. This is about as low profile as it gets, but a couple of teens would certainly be happy to spend an hour or two playing games, I am sure. Um, again, we have the coffee reference. You can see on that little sandwich board down next to the TV, it says coffee on Tuesdays. So you come, you drink coffee. You chit chat. That's all there is to it. Um, on the table, we have art supplies and um, paper, colored pencils, markers. No one house or classroom would probably ever have all that stuff. And yet they can come to this neutral territory and use all of it and be engaged in all of it. Make something, create something, play, learn. And so I think these are all ways that you're, maybe you can look at these ideas and get examples for your library about how you can do all of these things. A quick note here about um, virtual third places. So you might be watching this and thinking, you know, what about the elderly in my community, the homebound, uh, the immunocompromised? Um, surely libraries don't have to get people in the building in order to be a third place. And it's true, I, I think you you maybe don't always have to, although a coworker and I have been kind of arguing about this as I've been recording this module here, but I, I really do think that when possible, a physical third place is an important thing and can go a lot farther and furthering some of those benefits that we saw on the earlier slide. And yet not everyone does have that opportunity. And so your library can be a virtual third place. Um, maybe it's something like offering a Zoom book club or a Zoom coffee hour. Um, if you do have people who would be technically capable of logging in from home um, and can't actually make it to the library, that could be a great way to foster connection and decrease loneliness. Um, maybe it's something like, you know, you've got your regulars who get together for coffee on Tuesday mornings, but then a lot of them are snowbirds. Can you offer a Zoom component so those snowbirds can stay connected to each other, whether they're in Arizona or Florida or Texas or wherever they do their wintering, um, they can still stay connected to each other. Um, the third, the library can also foster virtual third places by being a place where people can bring a device or maybe use your devices to connect to the internet and connect with their communities that way. Um, so not everyone has broadband at home. We're going to talk about that more in the um, digital literacy module, but uh, you can offer solid internet, reliable Wi-Fi, um, good, good hardware for people to use and connect virtually as well. So I do think that physical third places matter and thinking about those eight criteria and applying them to your library's physical existence is important, um, but it's not necessarily for everyone. I have to acknowledge that not everyone can engage that way. And so thinking virtually does matter as well. I want to close with this quote um, from Dr. James Elmborg, actually a professor of mine at the University of Iowa when I was there several years ago. Um, but he points out kind of, and we've talked about this in this module as we've gone along here, that um, third places, as Dr. Oldenburg defines them, they do have some things that make them um, a bit tricky, right? 
they can be kind of gendered. There can be a cost associated with being there. There can be um, some unspoken social rules about being there. Um, and so the concept of third place really matters. But what Dr. Umberg gets in this article is that maybe libraries and librarians can create a better third place. Um, so maybe it's de-emphasizing some of those rules, going out of your way to make sure that everyone feels welcome in your library, being a sort of democratic space, small d Democrat, where you know, people are working together and engaged in the community development, creating conversation and using information. Um, and so he defines this, this better third place, which I think is something we all can aspire to in our libraries. So with that, I say thank you for watching. Um, if you scroll down, if you've got the slides downloaded, there is a reference and reading list that follows this slide here. But once again, how to get a hold of me. Uh, if you want me to come out to your library and look around, I always love to do that. Feel free to reach out. Um, and, or if you just want to chat about this concept in general, I'm willing to do that too. So thanks again. Have a great day.